This is Earth Files, the award-winning news site with the latest updates in science, environment, and real X-Files. Podcasting in-depth reports beyond the 6 o'clock news by Emmy Award-winning journalist Linda Moulton Howe. There is a moon in our solar system that is about the size of Earth's moon, but beneath its icy surface is a liquid water ocean 100 miles deep. That moon is Europa, one of 49 known moons that orbit Jupiter, of which Europa, Io, Ganymede, and Callisto are the largest. Earlier this year, NASA announced that its next proposed multi-billion dollar robotic space project will be the Europa-Jupiter system mission. If funding proceeds, NASA's Europa orbiter will launch in 2020 and will be joined by a European Space Agency craft that will focus on Ganymede while NASA looks for life on Europa. Ganymede, the largest moon in our solar system, larger than the planet Mercury, might also have an ocean. Traveling from Earth to Jupiter will take the two spacecraft six years and another two and a half years for NASA to get into orbit around Europa and for the European Space Agency to get into orbit around Ganymede by around 2029. One scientist here on Earth who can't wait is Robert J. Greenberg, Ph.D. and Professor of Planetary Sciences in the Lunar and Planetary Lab at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Recently at the American Astronomical Society's Planetary Science Meeting, Professor Greenberg presented his Europa research about oxygen production in Europa's icy crust. Oxygen is produced by interactions between energetic particles such as solar wind with the ice. Professor Greenberg finds that because Europa has so many open cracks on its outer ice shell, that surface oxygen would be delivered down into Europa's ocean at such a rate that the water could have a hundred times more oxygen than originally expected. Professor Greenberg thinks the concentrations of oxygen could be great enough to support both microorganisms and even larger sea creatures. Professor Greenberg did work with the Galileo spacecraft team when Galileo orbited Jupiter starting in 1995 for eight years and made repeated flybys Europa. That's when he concluded that all the crack patterns on Europa could be explained if you had a combination of tides and liquid water below the ice. And what could produce bigger tides than massive Jupiter? Its gravitational force pulling and stretching Europa continually, not only causing its ice to crack and break up, but the friction of all that pushing and pulling would heat up the water of Europa, keeping it liquid. The largest known liquid water ocean in our solar system, with twice as much liquid water as in all of the Earth's oceans combined. All that stretching and cracking above a deep ocean would also explain why the surface of Europa is so young. Here now is Professor Richard Greenberg. The surface of Europa is extremely dynamic. There are very few craters, and we have a good idea of how quickly craters should form as small bodies collide with the surface. And based on that rate, we know that the surface has to be very, very young because there are so few craters. The surface of Europa is less than 50 million years old. That's really only about 1% of the age of the solar system. So another way to look at that is dinosaurs were already extinct on Earth by the time the current surface of Europa was formed. So on Europa, you have this icy crust on top of this huge ocean, and it's a global ocean. And the icy crust is continually being reworked so that no part of it is older than about 1% of the age of the solar system. It's true that there is twice as much liquid water on Europa under that ice than there is in all of the combined oceans of the Earth? That's right. The H2O on Europa is about 100 miles deep. And uh, there's a few miles of ice on top of it, but almost all of that 100 miles of water is uh, is liquid water. The Earth's oceans are only a few miles deep, and so even though the Earth is a lot bigger, Europa has a lot more liquid water. Its oceans are just so deep. Did that surprise you? Well, I think it was a surprise back in 79 when we realized that there could be so much heating out there so far from the sun. 
you know, once we sort of overcame that surprise, then it was kind of a natural step to expect there'd be an ocean there. When did you all know that there was twice as much water under the ice of Europa than in all of the combined oceans of Earth? Well, we knew that there was uh, twice as much H2O altogether around the time of the Voyager spacecraft, because from the gravitational field of Europa, we could tell that the outer 100 miles was not rock. It was low density, you know, the density similar to, to H2O. We didn't know for sure whether it was, it was melted. But uh, once we got images from the Galileo spacecraft during the 1990s, it was really pretty clear from the evidence, the resurfacing, the rapid changes in the surface, that there had to be liquid water down below. And a lot of it. That's right. Once we realized it was liquid, we knew that most of that 100 miles thick had to be liquid. And where there's water, at least from an Earth point of view, there is almost always life. That's right. And as soon as uh, people started thinking about the possibility of an ocean there, life <laughs> to almost everybody's mind simultaneously. And there's been a lot of speculation. And there are a couple of issues about that. One issue is the question of whether there would be a source of oxygen. You know, organisms live in our oceans because there's oxygen mixed into the water. And um, that oxygen comes from the atmosphere. So the question is, where would you get oxygen? How could you have oxygen in the oceans of Europa, given that the ocean is under a really thick layer of ice and that there is no atmosphere above the ice? Everybody really wanted, they were so excited about the possibility of, of life that they thought about alternative forms of life, forms of life that instead of being based on oxygen, you know, the way our metabolisms are, instead they uh, drew their energy from the chemistry of hot springs at the bottom of the ocean. There are organisms like that on Earth, but we really don't know about, you know, what it's like at the bottom of the ocean on Europa. What we do know about Europa is that there is some oxygen mixed in at the top of the ice. That oxygen is produced by energetic charged particles, things like electrons that are bombarding the surface. And those things are dangerous for life at the surface, but what they do is they break up the H2O ice. And, you know, the O in H2O is oxygen. And so some of the ice on the surface of Europa uh, has oxygen mixed in with it. And the calculations that I've done recently suggest that a lot of that oxygen can work its way down to the ocean. And this really kind of opens up the possibility of life down there. What would the temperature be in the water? Well, it would be the same temperature that seals are quite comfortable at swimming in the Earth's uh, Arctic regions, basically the melting point of water, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Is it possible there could be large animals in that water on Europa? Well, temperature isn't the problem. Uh, the question would be, is there enough substances that you need to support life? Do you have organic compounds that uh, life could use? Do you really have enough oxygen? It looks as though there is quite a bit of oxygen, and so it is conceivable that there'd be multicellular organisms as well as single-cellular microorganisms. Probably wouldn't be a great place for a seal because, remember, seals have to stick their heads up through the ice and breathe air. In that sense, Europa would be quite different. You definitely need to have organisms that could exploit the oxygen or other chemicals that are down in the water. We don't know whether there's anything there, uh, whether there's anything living there. We don't have any evidence. But the fact that oxygen could find its way down into the ocean in abundance really uh, increases the likelihood that there is life there. You have estimated that there may be a hundred times more oxygen than scientists had anticipated before now? Yeah. Um, what I've done is I've considered the processes that we know reshape the surface of the ice and uh, taking those processes into account, how quickly does the oxygen work its way down to the ocean. I was really surprised at how much oxygen can get down there. Have you talked with marine scientists about what possible range of life might be on Europa in that water? Yeah, you know, certainly I've talked with some quite knowledgeable marine scientists who know about uh, life in the Arctic. Nobody really knows what could be there. Almost certainly it would be quite different from anything on Earth. All we have is an understanding that the conditions, as far as we know, could be hospitable to life. Is there any kind of a scientific instrument that we could put on some kind of an orbiting spacecraft that could confirm once and for all if there is something emanating from Europa that would say this is a living signature? Well, I, you know, I, I think it would be very hard to do from orbit as oxygen that's created on the surface can find its way down to the ocean. I think a lot of the material on the surface now has actually worked its way up from the ocean. 
So my feeling is that if we could get some kind of a lander to plop down on the surface and could sample the surface, almost any place that we landed on Europa, my guess is that we would be sampling material that had been part of the liquid ocean sometime in the not-too-distant past. So you know, even if we can't get down to the ocean, we could probably sample it right at the surface. Well, why is the Europa Ocean so dynamic that it keeps bringing everything from below up? Well, the key to everything is tides. On the Earth, when we think about tides, we think about standing at the shore and the water rises and falls two cycles a day. But really, when you step back and and think about what's happening to a planet, to our planet or any planet, when tides are acting, is that the entire planet is being stretched, stretched and unstretched. So when that happens on Earth, it's the water that kind of gets pulled out, and that's why the height of the ocean goes up and down. Um, In a place like uh, Europa, the whole body is also being stretched and unstretched, and, and it happens over the course of three and a half days basically during every orbit of Europa around, around Jupiter. And it's that continual working that's responsible for everything. The whole body is worked, stretched, and unstretched every three and a half days, and so there's a lot of friction. And that friction is why so much of the water is melted into liquid form. But the continual stretching and unstretching also cracks the surface and works the surface a lot. It's sort of as if you tried to take a, a raw egg and uh, change how long it is every three and a half days, stretch it and unstretch it. Well, you can imagine what's going to happen to the shell. The shell's going to crack and continually be worked. And that's the same thing's happening on Europa. The ice is being cracked and worked continually. And that's what makes the place so active. And you mean that all of that stretching and cracking is being caused by the massive gravitational pull of Jupiter, correct? That's right. It's the pull of Jupiter. And the pull of Jupiter changes at Europa because Europa is on an eccentric orbit. It's closer on one part of its orbit and farther on the other. So every time Europa goes around Jupiter, the whole shape of Europa gets stretched longer and then shorter. But there's something that's even more amazing. If you think about those tides, the same tides that make all that heat and that work the uh, the crust, those tides would also tend to cause Europa's orbit to become circular, actually quite quickly. And um, if it became circular, then you wouldn't have this tidal change. Europa would be going around, but nothing would be working the surface. But there's a really interesting relationship with uh, two of the other satellites. There are three satellites that are are in what we call an orbital resonance. And these satellites are Io, Europa, and Ganymede. Every time Ganymede goes around once, Europa goes around exactly twice. And every time Europa goes around Jupiter, Io goes around exactly twice. So the ratio of their orbital periods is 1 to 2 to 4. Io's period is exactly half of Europa's, and Ganymede's is exactly twice Europa's. And as a result, the gravitational pull of these satellites on one another is what causes their eccentricities, causes their orbits to be eccentric. And it's that orbital eccentricity that's responsible for the tidal heating and the tidal cracking and all the activity on the surface. So uh, if there is life on Europa, it would be impossible if it weren't for this resonance among the three satellites. That would also explain why Io has so much volcanic activity? Exactly. Yep. Same thing. If it weren't for that resonance, Io's eccentricity would damp down and uh, there wouldn't be any uh, tidal friction and you wouldn't have the volcanic activity. And what dynamic is on Ganymede? Well, uh, Ganymede um, is further away from Jupiter. Well, Io is the closest, and so it has been most susceptible to tidal effects. That's why it's been um, just, you know, heated to such an extreme. Uh, Europa is further out. Um, the tidal effects there have been enough to keep most of the um, the H2O in liquid form. Uh, Ganymede is a little bit, is even further out, and so it has um, signs of some uh, geological activity, um, but also a lot of it um, just looks old and cratered. So it's it's uh, sort of in between. It, it just doesn't have um, qu- anything quite as dramatic as what's happened on Io and Europa. Why do you think that Europa has ended up with the most water in the solar system right next to two other moons that don't have water? Well, Ganymede has a lot of water. It's just that it's ice. Oh. So, so the thing about Europa is uh, that uh, it's got a lot of water and it's um, heated It's heated by tides, so it's liquid water. But still, the question, what do you suppose would explain why is it that Europa 
has so much water, much more water than the Earth even? Um, oh, well, uh, two things. Uh, for, uh, you know, as you go further out in the solar system, uh, bodies tend to be made, uh, have a much uh, greater composition of, uh, or component of water. Um, uh, it's just, it's one of the things that uh, c- condensed out as the cloud of dust and gas um, was cooling, um, the, the cr- cloud and du- of dust and gas around the sun. Um, it, wa- it's, it was harder for water to condense uh, close into the sun where, where it was hot, um, but it could, could condense further out and became part of, of the uh, bodies in the outer solar system. Um, similarly, uh, within uh, that sort of mini solar system that formed around uh, Jupiter, um, you have a variation in the uh, composition of the the, uh, the things that were able to condense out, and a lot of water was able to condense out um, at the uh, at the distance uh, from Jupiter uh, where Europe is. And so, an almost bigger surprise in our solar system is the fact that the third planet from the sun should have so much water. That's uh, us. Well, you know, actually, that's, uh, you know, it's still not entirely clear uh, why, uh, you know, where the water came from um, on, on Earth. Earth. So that's, that's uh, certainly a, a, a topic of considerable interest. Uh, scientists are, are uh, modeling the, uh, the process of formation of planets to try to understand uh, how the, um, the budget of different materials uh, found its way uh, to different parts of the solar system. When you and other planetary scientists get together, do you make bets with each other about which planet or moon we will find for sure life on first? Well, I'm sure people have made that bet. <laughs> um, what would you bet? Uh, what would I bet? I, you know, I, I, think, um, I think there's a good chance that we'll find uh, signs of, uh, of past life, if not present life, on Mars. Um, but I think that uh, there's probably even a better chance it might be easier to find it uh, on Europa, or the, probably the best chance of finding current life would be on Europa. And I think people have um, overestimated how hard it would be uh, to get to, to find life on Europa. I, I think there's been sort of this obsession with somehow drilling down to the ocean to find, the, um, to find life. In other words, getting down through the icy crust. Um, but my feeling is that because the ice is permeable, um, we really can sample that ocean near the surface. By putting some kind of a lander right on top of that ice. Right. I think if we landed on top of the ice, you could actually sample the ocean right there. If you were making an educated guess about when we might have three-inch high headlines around the world, life discovered beyond Earth. When do you think that might be? Well, you know, I think it's going to be further into the future than I'd like. NASA is planning what they call a flagship mission to the outer solar system, which will uh, most likely be a Europa orbiter. That spacecraft will be in orbit around Europa something like 19 or 20 years from now. And, you know, it'll make some interesting measurements and observations, but it's not going to drop anything onto the surface. So I don't think there's a chance of finding life then. It's really going to be, I think, when someone comes up with an affordable way to plop down an instrument onto the surface that we're really going to find out. And, you know, my feeling is probably if um, if there were the will and the money, it could be done, you know, within a couple of decades. But uh, more likely it's going to be uh, a few decades after that, I'm afraid. And before then... The most likely other place is Mars, either ancient dead life or possibly microbes now. Yeah, you know, um, we're all over Mars. And so, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised any day to hear there is some evidence. Thanks for listening to this Earth Files podcast from the edges of science, environment and real X-Files. Go to www.earthfiles.com to see more than a thousand Earth Files reports with photographs, drawings, and documents. And visit Earth Files every day, every week, for new reports and new podcasts. That's www.earthfiles.com. 